Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Web Innovation Weeks and EdTech Innovation Week. Today, we are starting a very exciting uh, panel of speakers. And first, I just want to uh, make sure that you know that we did uh, have an opening address by Karen Myers, the business uh, development leader from the World Wide Web Consortium yesterday um, about the whole week of uh, ed tech, education technology innovations. Very exciting program. But this morning is with great pleasure that um, I get to introduce three very exciting panelists studying uh, with Maku Hakinen, uh, Director of the Digital Accessibility at ETS, and um, Alvin Ramos, Dean of Dianza College, and Charles Watkinson, Director of University of Michigan Press. With that said, uh, I uh, just want to say how honored I am to have invited leaders uh, in, in education technologies and leaders in education to talk about the keys to the future, the keys to the future and the innovation that they're leading. The formats for this, uh, of this uh, forum will start with individual presentation, talking about their thought leadership, starting with Maku and then uh, Charles and Alvin, and then please everybody stay uh, for the rest of the discussion, because we're going to gather everybody to come back to have a panel discussion, to deep dive uh, within this one hour about their thought leadership. So stay tuned with us. Please stay with us uh, through this one hour. So uh, with that said, uh, may I invite uh, Maku uh, to come in? Yes. And um, the rest of the panelists, let us all um, uh, mute. Uh, and um, turn down our camera. Okay, um, I am going to start my screen sharing. Yes. And I hope everyone can see my screen. Is that a yes? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So. Um, yeah, my name is Marku Hakkinen, and I'm Director of Digital Accessibility and lead the Accessibility Solutions and Inclusive Technology Group at Educational Testing Service in Princeton, New Jersey. And I, my group is uh, one that has a lot of involvement with W3C standards, particularly in the accessibility area. And so uh, what I'm going to do today is share some of my thoughts on web, web and accessibility standards and how they're essential elements of, of inclusive ed tech. And uh, I know all of us have had quite a challenging 19 months or so of COVID. So I'll touch on some of the lessons we've learned regarding accessibility and ed tech in this new world. So let me move on. So digital accessibility and inclusive design. So many of you have heard about accessibility, and if you haven't, it's really a, a growing field of study, research, and practice. And we're seeing its impact in many ways from how accessibility is playing a role in standards, how accessibility and inclusive design features are appearing in um, products, desktop software products, mobile phones, and elsewhere. We'll touch on some of those. Um, today, thanks to the World Wide Web Consortium, accessibility is being woven into the fabric of many technical standards that underlie the technologies we use every day in building and using educational technologies. I want to make the point that by following accessibility standards, best practices, and inclusive design principles, we can create products that work better for everyone, including those with disabilities. So I just want to uh, quickly review some of the W3C accessibility standards. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, you will uh, hear more of them uh, during this session and later this week from other presenters. So we have the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, what we often call simply WCAG. So WCAG version 2.1 is the current standard. 
And if you look at um, both international standards and US uh, laws, um, WCAG is featured in things like Section 508 in the new European accessibility regulations. And it's very influential. Um, when we are looking at offering educational technology products, we're often asked, are you conformant with WCAG 2.1 AA, for example? And so there is both um, an interest on the part of consumers of technology, the purchasers of technology, and the vendors to address accessibility guidelines and standards. WCAG 3.0 is currently in development, and that builds upon the uh, impact of WCAG 2 and takes it a little bit further in looking at different conformance models. And so if you're interested, you should take a look at where WCAG 3 is going, because it's gonna, again, have an impact on all the work that we do in building accessible platforms and technologies. There's something called the Accessible Rich Internet Application Standard, or WAE ARIA, and it's something that's helped us tremendously to take internet applications, very interactive applications, and make them more accessible to users of assistive technologies, such as screen readers. And then we have standards such as Web VTT and Time Text. Very important when we look at how we make videos and other media streams accessible to those who may have hearing impairments, for example. So they provide captions as a technology option. And finally, work that, that I'm involved in and members of my group are involved in is something called pronunciation of spoken text. With the growing um, uh, ubiquity of spoken assistance, voice assistance and such, we are seeing speech becoming more and more of a dominant interaction model. But people with disabilities, primarily those with visual impairments, for example, have been using text-to-speech synthesis for a very long time. And so our work on the pronunciation standard is to try to provide better quality text to speech for educational content and other professional content. So that is something that we're excited about and it's an ongoing development activity. So accessibility, it's basically built into most of the technology we use today. And I have some screenshots of the uh, accessibility settings panel from Mac OS that's on the top uh, left. Toward the center, I have the accessibility settings panel from Windows 10. And on the right, I have it from iOS, from the iPhones and iPads. And then toward the lower uh, right, I have the accessibility settings from um, Chrome OS. And so basically every platform that students and, and faculties, learners all over use today have accessibility features and supports built in. The challenge, of course, is to make sure that the applications that are running on these platforms conform to standards, such as the W3C standards, and are built for accessibility. You can have applications that, that will run on these platforms that still won't work because developers did not consider accessibility, even though the platform can natively support it if it did have those features. Whoops, it goes. Okay, my screen isn't switching quickly enough. So just some example of some of the technologies. So I have a, um, an image here where I have an iPhone up on the uh, left side of the screen. And to the center top, I have a refreshable braille display that would work in conjunction with the screen reader on the mobile phone and the smartphone. And it would work through Bluetooth. And literally with today's um, uh, technology standards and connectivity, you can simply um, tell the uh, screen reader on your phone that you want to use this braille display and connect to it via Bluetooth. It just works. Beneath the braille display, I have a Bluetooth enabled switch interface. So if you're unable to use a keyboard or a mouse and instead rely upon a switch interface to drive things such as scanning menus, on your device, again, that can connect directly via Bluetooth to a smartphone. And finally, uh, another assistive device that is, is a mainstream device, such as the AirPods from, uh, AirPods from Apple, which can provide assistive hearing capabilities. Again, these are just some of the types of things that are available and work today. And if we build again for accessibility standards, these are the types of uh, tools and technologies that help individuals can also uh, work with our applications. 
So despite progress, um, we've made good progress in accessibility. We've got good standards. We've got a lot of developments on the different platforms to support accessibility. There are always going to be challenges. The rapid pace of technology advances continue to raise accessibility barriers. And one of the important things in the standards world, uh, particularly in the work of a W3C group that one of my uh, staff member participates in and leads, the Research Questions Task Force, try to anticipate where the accessibility problems will occur with new technologies being developed by W3C. But for technologies in general, um, we have to be concerned that as we find the next new bright, shiny object that provides all sorts of advantages for some, it may exclude others. One of the other concerns we see is that innovative startup companies tend to ignore accessibility at the outset. Many startups are looking to build the next great ed tech product through the model of the minimally viable product or MVP. And oftentimes when you look at the MVP, accessibility gets left off that minimally viable set. And it's important for us to try to encourage those who are building new technologies in the startups that an MVP without accessibility isn't viable. Finally, there's also a lack of accessibility knowledge and training. It's typically not a component of IT and user experience academic programs, and we're trying to change that. There are great efforts such as Teach Access, for example, which are trying to get uh, accessibility more part of the IT and computer science curriculums. And I think the most important point here is that there is often a failure to engage users with disabilities in product design and development. It's very important to ensure that when you are building something, you're building it with the involvement of the users who uh, best know the technology and their requirements. So the importance of usable accessibility. Um, one of the key things we try to stress to, to people developing web applications, for example, is to apply the web content accessibility, that shouldn't have changed, uh, apply the web content accessibility guidelines but you have to look beyond just a checklist approach to conformance with these standards. You really have to, as I said in the last slide, understand and involve the user and also the assistive technologies they use when you're creating new systems. You can't make assumptions about what you think is the way a user may use this technology. You need to understand exactly how it's used. And one of the other cautionary statements I often tell developers is that it's possible to create something that is a checklist conformance um, accessible product, but it still isn't usable because you haven't considered how someone with a screen reader, for example, actually uses the technology or the product. So let's go on to what all of us experienced over the last uh, uh, year and a half, 19 months. So accessibility and COVID. We all knew that travel came to a halt. There was global uncertainty, businesses, and most importantly, schools closed, conferences canceled. Everything was disrupted. And I have a quote from the World Bank here that basically says at the peak of the lockdown, the pandemic caused 180 countries to close schools temporarily, forcing 85% of the world's learners out of school. So that is a tremendous impact. And how did technology and how did accessibility get impacted during that period? So individual impact, everyone would ask, whether you're a student or an employee, how would I go to school? How can I do my job? There's this whole added factor of stress of the unknown. And then challenges of studying or working at home if you could actually work from home without uh, disruption or you had a place where you could actually work. Um, internet connectivity and technology challenges were, were dominant all over. Um, and finally, I think the end effect is many of us became situationally disabled by COVID. We were for, forced to work in new and constrained ways. We had to uh, meet with challenges that we did not plan for. So the COVID pandemic pivot. In less than a year, COVID drove you know, global adoption of remote work and distance learning. And in our own work, we had to look at how that would impact, for example, testing. We moved from physical common spaces for work and learning to virtual spaces. How do we take physical accessibility and make it work in the virtual world? This transition was not always easy and individual experiences have varied. Some people had better experiences, some people still have bad experiences. 
So facing these challenges of digital technology, if you had difficulty with technology before COVID, you're going to be even at risk of being further left behind because the accessibility features weren't there for you when you were remote. So one of the things that we like to say about uh, working in accessibility is that we thrive on challenges and problem solving. So this COVID pivot to remote work and learning meant accessibility was even more critical to everything we did. And we saw this quite uh, dramatically with the rapid adoption of things like Zoom and Microsoft Teams. And quickly we found out, particularly in my team, where the accessibility problems were. What didn't work for someone who was using a screen reader with Microsoft Teams or Zoom. But the great thing was that we were seeing the companies, Zoom and Microsoft, begin to treat accessibility issues seriously. And we saw frequent updates in these platforms to improve accessibility. They're not perfect, but a lot of things that were real showstoppers for individuals got fixed pretty quickly. So failing to solve accessibility limitations meant that people were being excluded from work or learning. We had to find ways to fix things. Another thing that we noted was going from a controlled enterprise IT type environment where everybody was on the same platforms using the same types of tools to really a user owned technology and user owned assistive technology model really introduced new challenges. Think about the many different types of versions, combinations of assistive technologies and platforms and how do we support them? So out of this crisis comes progress. So for many of us in accessibility, the workload increased. We had to find new solutions to address barriers, think outside of the box frequently. One of the things that, that helped us, I think, was that when our working efforts in W3C, they're truly international efforts, truly in many cases, remote collaborative work. And so our involvement in W3C, I think, gave us a bit of a leg up in being able to work more effectively remotely. So I wanted to share some of the lessons learned. And so lesson one, digital accessibility is essential. Said another way, accessibility is not an option. The US and EU legislation that's uh, been passed require that digital products and services be accessible to people with disabilities. Failing to consider accessibility in the design of products and services can lead to excluding some of the 1 billion people in the world who have one or more disabilities. And those facing situational disabilities, for example, many of us during COVID, can benefit from more accessible, inclusive, and usable technologies. I find myself using uh, subtitles and captions a lot more during meetings because I can't always hear everything clearly, but I can uh, catch it with the captions. So lesson two, treat accessibility failures as bugs. If some part of a product doesn't work, traditional software testing treats that as a bug log the bug and get it scheduled for fixing. Accessibility failures that are preventing someone from being able to do their work need to be considered with the same gravity as other software problems. Companies need to expand their software testing and quality assurance to include accessibility. And we need to shift accessibility testing earlier in the development cycle, test early and test often. So these accessibility areas, errors don't get out into the field. And finally, Lesson three, understand and involve people with disabilities in product design and development. The statement, nothing for us without us, has been used to highlight the importance of involving people with disabilities in developing accessible solutions. Never assume you know the solution. Listen to individuals with disabilities and understand what works for them. And when we think about bring your own devices to work, BYOD, it also means bring your own assistive technologies, which can be anything. So in closing, accessibility and inclusive design needs to be part of everything we create, design, and build, especially in ed tech. The pandemic highlighted this need as technologies were rushed into wide use to solve immediate challenges of remote work and learning. So we need to continue to develop new technologies and tools to support all of us in this new post-COVID world, which will be a hybrid world from everything we're seeing. So these are challenging problems and exciting opportunities are ahead for all of us. So questions? Um, Maku, um, this is a really exciting talk. Um, I uh, just want to uh, share is that um, when um, uh, this morning, when we started the session uh, and as the head of uh, the W3C New York Metro chapter, 
I suddenly realized that uh, we did not have uh, the automatic uh, closed caption. Um, and I just want to also, uh, I'm very inspired uh, by this morning uh, discussion with you that we will uh, do uh, a remedy to that with the video. And, uh, and also there are a video uh, that we will be uh, 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 releasing uh, on YouTube, uh, very public, uh, and it will be closed caption. So just bear with us uh, with that. Uh, so uh, it's a lesson learned. So yes. let me come back to this uh, bold uh, statement, uh, accessibility is not an option. So uh, I want to ask you this question, how can we make it not an option? Like even I in the midst of designing, and I know that my speaker is going to talk about web accessibility and I did not check the web accessibility option, the button. <laughs> so, the, so my question is how can we do that as a, you know, in leading that mindset? I think, I think one of the things that's important here is to begin to think about accessibility as just the normal way of doing things, to normalize accessibility in everything we do. We see products from, from Microsoft, for example, that begin to place accessibility features right up on the toolbar with everything else. Uh, Microsoft Teams now, I believe, starts transcription by default. And so I think the, the, the step is that accessibility shouldn't be seen as an extra step you might forget, but it is just there as part of the normal feature set. Okay, yeah, um, I'm looking at, um, I think that that's well said, right? It's really um, a mindset from the product development point of yes. view and the service delivery point of view, right? Like, you know, like this happened to me and of, you know, I, I'm, I'm just amazed like how lack of focus <clears throat> of that, right? Like that is not like in the first checklist because we do have a checklist for even for this event. Yes. Um, I'm, I, I I'm just want to add one of the, one of the <laughs> point though, is that yeah. again, I mean, this was brought home during uh, some, some teaching. I was teaching hybrid, hybrid accessibility course over the summer and we provided live, live captions for the lectures. And we got several comments from students. This is an international course and students who were non-native English speakers were very thankful that you provided captions that really helps me. So it's, it's not just a uh, focusing on one need, it's really solving for many possible needs. Absolutely, yeah, I, I would imagine so, right? It, it yeah. can maybe make like a global communication better with accessibility, right? Because now yes. you can understand better what each other is talking about. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that, that's a, a, actually a, a, a byproduct, you know, a very nice byproduct of web accessibility. Yeah, yes. well said, yeah. Um, thank you, Maku. So uh, please stay uh, there and um, I uh, will now invite uh, Charles. Thank you, Maku, for your talk. And I okay, will- thank you. Thank you, yeah. And, um, and I'm going to um, uh, stop my camera and uh, welcome Charles Wilkinson, right? Uh, Director of the University of Michigan Press. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you to uh, you and to Karen for inviting me to speak. Uh, Marku's presentation was a wonderful introduction. And what I want to talk about today is how, as Marku says, accessibility opens the door to lots of other opportunities. And I'm going to talk about this case study of University of Michigan Press and our publication of monographs. And I just want to uh, introduce those two kind of terms because university press and monographs may not be the sort of thing that you might expect to hear about in a session on leadership and innovation. Um, and I want to explain how accessibility is changing that situation. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen here um, and you should be seeing my screen saying quick facts about university presses. Um, so, uh, and Rachel, do you see that safely? Yes. Great, thank yes. you. So university presses are not-for-profit publishers and they exist at uh, universities uh, around the world. Um, and you can see here uh, on the Association of University Presses site that they are globally spread and they're particularly concentrated in North America. 
and I, of course, uh, am in uh, Michigan, so in the mitten amidst the Great Lakes there. Um, and so university presses uh, exist to uh, expand access to information, and accessibility is clearly essential in expanding access to digital information. The University of Michigan Press is a publisher predominantly of monographs, and monographs are books basically written by scholars for other scholars. Uh, and we publish about 80 to 100 monographs a year in subjects like performing arts and political science, also disability studies actually, um, but uh, then classical studies, et cetera. So these are um, books that have uh, existed in the same form for over 500 years uh, since the introduction of the printing press. And uh, they have been predominantly in print and uh, the move towards ebook formats has been a fairly slow one. And most of the uh, ebook formats produced are very static. Uh, the PDF has been the dominant form. Uh, they look just like the print book. Uh, the opening of the EBUB3 standard and W3C's support for that standard has really changed the picture for university presses. And it has been the key to the future. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. I first wanted to uh, introduce a very important piece of work that was done by uh, Michael Elliott, who's a dean at Emory University in Atlanta, uh, called The Future of the Monograph in the Digital Era. And it was sponsored by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And this was back in 2015. And what Michael did is he brought together a group of faculty members in the humanities and social sciences who really thought about monograph publishing to think about the future of the monograph. And I think what's really useful about this project, and this is an article in the Journal of Electronic Publishing, is the sort of taxonomy uh, that Michael and his colleagues actually sort of laid out uh, for the monograph. So they talked a lot about the value of the monograph, but they also talked about this grouping of kind of four different types of monograph for the future. And first of all, they talked about print monographs. And those are these kind of familiar formats uh, that you see on the shelves of university libraries. And then they talked about long form scholarship published digitally with a strong resemblance to print monographs. So these are uh, fairly basic EPUB 3 predominantly text publications. And then they talked about long form scholarship published digitally that is substantially enhanced by the digital format. And uh, we've come to call these enhanced ebooks. And then they talked about digitally published long form scholarship that is not suitable for print publication. And we've come to call those interactive scholarly works. So I wanted to introduce that kind of taxonomy and now I'm going to show some examples of those and talk about how accessibility has been the key to the future for these new forms of monograph. I'm going to focus in on um, a platform that we've developed at the University of Michigan called Fulcrum. And Fulcrum is an open source platform uh, and it's been built since 2015 with accessibility at its core. And you'll find uh, at fulcrum.org a description of the platform. And you'll find that it has these four design principles that are absolutely key to every choice we make in developing this platform. So the first is that we exist to make content discoverable. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about discoverability and how that's facilitated by the W3C standards. And then we want to make content accessible. And of course, that's a big theme today. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And finally, and this is really important, we want to make content durable. And durability is so important, and that uh, comes into preservation and standards-based approaches, uh, because this is the life's work in many cases. The monograph is the life's work of a scholar. And if we transfer the format of a monograph into a digital space and then don't preserve it, 
then we're doing a real disservice to knowledge and future generations. And then overarching all of this is the ability to be flexible. And for me, flexibility is a lot about being able to move beyond the text, move beyond the format of this kind of printed book and think about multimedia and data and other forms of object as being part of the monographic package. But it's also about interoperability and about being able to work well with other open source systems. And of course, that is enabled by the standards that W3C uh, um, uh, manages and, and oversees. So flexible, durable, discoverable, and accessible. And you can learn more about fulcrum.org uh, here on this page, including the uh, work we have been doing on accessibility. And you'll find the accessibility um, policy uh, down at the bottom of the page. So I'm, I'm going to talk now about these uh, three particular case studies. And I want to start with a book, which is one of these simple ebooks. It's a simple EPUB 3. It's almost entirely text, and it's called Coronavirus Politics. And this was a book published uh, early in the pandemic uh, to look at the comparative performance of different governments around the world in handling those initial days of the pandemic back in spring 2020. I want to just point out here uh, that this is the page, uh, the landing page on Fulcrum for Coronavirus Politics. And it's actually an open access book, which means this book is free to read for anybody around the world. And I just want to point out what the impact of that choice uh, is and how that is really made possible by the W3C, that this book really truly can be used around the world. And so I'm showing a page now that shows the uh, engagement and use of this book around the world using the outmetric.com tracker. And one of the interesting things is one of the major places we've had use of this book is in Brazil. Um, and uh, the Brazilian news media, um, uh, the Twitter uh, uh, influencers, uh, lots of people have been really focusing on this book and translating sections into Portuguese, etc. Um, so this book is really having an impact around the world. Uh, thanks to the discoverability that uh, W3 standards permit. So let me just go into the book and just show you um, what the EPUB 3 format is uh, providing for us in terms of uh, basic functionality uh, for accessibility. So you'll see on the page here, this is a, um, a, a textual uh, uh, page. Um, it can be uh, expanded um, uh, and uh, manipulated so that uh, the text size can increase. Um, and there are other basic uh, features here to help with uh, accessibility. Um, so let me just uh, go, go there, save the changes, and you'll see this is now much bigger. And the EPUB file that underlies this, you'll see actually has a, a page uh, pages in the text so that as a screen reader reads this, the reader can tell exactly which uh, page they're on. And also uh, facilitated are some basic tools uh, that are um, made possible by W3 standards. So here is an annotation tool. Uh, in this case, it's called um, Hypothesis. Um, and uh, this is a, an open source overlay uh, that can be used uh, to mark up, uh, highlight, um, to annotate in a very simple uh, kind of way. So there are some very basic uh, functionality aspects to this text only book uh, that are permitted and facilitated by W3C standards and by the EPUB 3 particularly that lives behind the scenes. I'm going to move now to another book, uh, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, this is an enhanced ebook in Eliot's Taxonomy, and this is called Music on the Move. And it's a textbook, uh, monograph stroke textbook. It's sort of used in classes. It was written for a research audience as well. And it's about the, mo the movement of musical traditions. And so this is a chapter on the Romani diaspora in Europe. So you can see here that in addition to 
uh, the um, text and maybe images that you'll usually see in a print book, there are some other features that can be embedded into the EPUB 3. So in this case, here's an interactive map and it shows the movement of uh, the Romani people uh, over the period from the 12th to the 16th century. So you can see that happening there. And then uh, there are um, video clips embedded here. And you'll see that uh, when I start to play this, you won't hear the music, sadly, because it's really wonderful music. But you will see uh, that, uh, you know, as, 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 as the players play, um, there will be a caption popping up. Uh, there we go. You can see that uh, the description uh, of what is happening appears on the screen. The hammer, dulcimer, and backup strings accompany the violin. And there's description of how the uh, music is proceeding as the musicians play. And then I'll move on now to uh, an audio clip. So this is um, a gypsy folk song from Hungary. And you'll see here, that uh, as the music plays, the, uh, the words and what's happening are highlighted on the screen. So these are fairly uh, familiar accessibility uh, features now um, uh, in many books. But what is really exciting is to see how these can be embedded in the EPUB 3. Uh, and I will say that all of these are uh, embedding tools are um, based on open standards. So what you're seeing here is the Able Player. Um, Able Player is an open source tool, which is being used to uh, play the videos um, and the audio. And for uh, images, uh, and this is an, uh, uh, an image that you can zoom in on and uh, sort of you know, examine more carefully. This is um, a player called Leaflet that's also being used for the maps. And the whole player is based on an open source, uh, the whole EPUB reader is based on the open source EPUB.js. So what W3C is permitting here is accessibility, but also the use of various different softwares to create a coherent experience within EPUB 3. So I wanted to show this really in the context of accessibility. And finally, I wanted to show an example of an interactive scholarly work. So um, archaeology is one of the areas in which we publish. And this is uh, an archaeological publication called A Mid-Republican House from Gabi E. And Gabi E is an archaeological site just outside Rome in Italy. And in this case, what we have is a 3D model embedded in the EPUB. And you can see in the text that you can actually move between the stratigraphic units so these are the sections of the archeological site and you can navigate to any stratigraphic unit and you can zoom in and you can examine this model, which is of a Roman house uh, or of a Roman period house uh, and all the different uh, artifacts and um, uh, objects that uh, the archeologists found in the house. Uh, so you can see that they found some uh, pottery in this a particular space in this stratigraphic unit. They found some uh, animal bones, um, but they didn't find any coins uh, or metal finds, unfortunately. And you can move to the database entry, the photographs, etc. So this is an example of how uh, uh, the W3C is permitting this kind of flexibility and interoperability. And I'll just end by saying, for subjects like archaeology, there's a very strong belief amongst uh, archaeologists that when they excavate, when they do this archaeological fieldwork, they're destroying the evidence that they're excavating. So as they cut down through it, they have to record it very, very carefully. And that's why I come back again to durability and the importance of preservation for these kinds of works. And that's where accessibility has such a strong overlap again. Because if you make a digital work accessible, you're forcing yourself to make it accessible to machines, not just humans. You're forcing it to make, forcing yourself to make it available to a, 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 an e-reader, to um, a, a, a software enabled machine read reader uh, that will 
interpret all the data. Uh, and that means using very standardized terms, um, also including a lot of metadata that will make it discoverable as well as durable and reconstructable by a future generation. So that's my presentation. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Charles, um, too bad they didn't find any coins. <laughs> 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 and um, I, uh, I believe this is the first presentation that really made me understand that the multimedia perspective and the human interaction with EPOP uh, tree. You know, I, I saw a lot of great presentations and this is the first time I, I got it, you know what I mean? And uh, thank you. Um, how, how does a, a WebCAG uh, uh, standard uh, relate to EPOP standard? Can you make the relationship here? Yeah. Uh, yes, um, I, uh, uh, the, the, the WebCAG standard uh, keeps us honest. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, uh, and uh, because we have to be sure that when we're constructing um, the uh, EPUB files themselves, that they're going to work in a web space. And I think that's very important because we have the two sides of uh, accessibility demonstrated here. Firstly, the content has to be uh, bundled in an EPUB 3 that is, is going to display in an accessible way, and the platform that it displays on has to be accessible. And um, that means that we have to uh, really think about um, accessibility right from the moment of working with the author right at the start of a, 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 a work. And it's something um, that requires, and this comes back to your theme of leadership, it requires that the whole organization is on board with accessibility. It requires that everybody in the organization thinks about accessibility, not just the technologists. Uh, because to make something fully compliant with WCAG, we have to make sure that the descriptions uh, are there for the images, and in many cases, the author is really the only one really qualified to write really good visual descriptions. And we have to make sure that uh, um, you know uh, all the metadata tags um, uh, that will communicate accessibility are embedded in the production file. Uh, we have to make sure our marketing materials are accessible as well as the content itself. So it's really, it takes a village. It's a whole whole team. So WCAG keeps us honest. Um, and uh, that, that, is, that is how it interacts with EPUB 3. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, um, I um, stay, uh, stay um, put uh, and wait for the panel discussion. Thank you. What an exciting um, presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to invite... Um, um, Elvin Ramos uh, to join us now. Hi, Elvin. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, hi, hi, Rachel. Yeah. Uh, let me first introduce again uh, Elvin Ramos, uh, uh, Dr. Ramos uh, from uh, Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities with, from Duenza, all right, Duenza uh, College. And uh, welcome. And um, uh, I am very excited because uh, uh, Elvin uh, perhaps is the only person I know who move uh, across the country <laughs> from New York, Washington, DC, and then to California. And during the pandemic, you literally move, right? <laughs> right, across uh, to California uh, where you are now. And when I asked uh, Alvin um, about uh, what does he think about innovation, uh, he immediately without um, a split second, but uh, no, a firm answer is Perkins Five uh, Innovation. So uh, I like to um, uh, first ask you, right? You know uh, about uh, your uh, your um, uh, thinking about uh, Perkins Five Innovation and um, how uh, what what your thought process is on that. Yeah. First of all, Rachel, thank you uh, for having me in this panel with Marku and Charles, um, and thank you for facilitating it. I am, um, you know, I'm always excited about um, any conversation regarding innovation, right? Uh, most especially as an agent in higher institution, <laughs> uh, higher education institution. Um, and the spirit of Marku and Charles' uh, presentation, which I think, um, uh, overall has this um, message of accessibility, which um, for me is an equalizer to opportunity. I, I really think that Perkin 5's um, 
is, is just that, right? Uh, Perkins 5 um, historically has been a legislation um, that has been put um, in the federal level in Congress since 2012. And during the Trump administration, um, I believe it was uh, July of 2018, where it was signed into law, right? Um, even though uh, the sort of model of career and technical education has been um, with secondary and post-secondary uh, schools uh, for a very long time to support that, to mold students from learning uh, to their career path. Um, Perkins 5 has now sort of um, given uh, us, um, you know, uh, stakeholders in, in different schools to sort of amplify academic programs, amplify the resources that uh, sort of would uh, connect and align uh, to this academic program to support not just faculty teaching, but the learning that happens in the classroom. Uh, and it also gives opportunity for students to get involved more beyond the classroom or beyond the institutions, right? So uh, Perkins 5 is actually, um, you know, it is, uh, it is to strengthen academic programs, right? It is uh, uh, in 2018, I, I believe the budget for it, the federal budget for it is about 1.3 billion. So you could imagine the magnitude, right? Um, and the amount distributed to different uh, secondary and post-secondary schools um, with a mandate uh, to say, let's really think about how we could sort of flip the script on what we're doing in the classroom, especially um, the CTE programs, which are uh, the career and technical education programs focus, uh, and, and be able to really support, you know, the nation's youth and adults um, in order to get um, to the career path that they really want. So that is sort of like um, an overall or brief descriptions uh, of Perkins 5. Um, and I think that now, um, you know, a lot of the schools that I've gotten a chance to work for and, um, and currently in are really thinking about how, um, how to use the funding uh, in, in a more, um, you know, innovative way, in a more um, uh, ways to, um, to make sure that our students are getting access to, um, you know, 21st century technology, right? Um, and, and I think that that is one of the most exciting focus uh, when you are involved in this world of Perkins 5 and uh, CTE. I, um, I, I, I know that um, uh, your department, um, can you maybe let us know how, how many students are there in, in the ANSA College, the, the department that you're leading now and the faculty? Sure. Yeah. yeah, so the ANSA College um, is actually um, uh, a member college of the Foothill De Anza Community College District, right? Um, it is located in Cupertino, uh, sort of like in the heart of Silicon Valley, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it is a college that is surrounded with all these big tech, um, you know, companies. Um, and there's two colleges at uh, uh, Foothill De Anza. One is De Anza, which is the, um, the older college, and then... Um, and then Foothill College. Uh, so they both uh, are in this district. And the ANSA and Foothill similarly um, carries about, I would say, 17 to 20,000 students, depending on um, you know, um, uh, enrollment. So as a district, uh, you could see enrollment really from, I would say, 25,000 to maybe the range of 35,000 within one you know, academic quarter, uh, because we're in a quarter system here. So my division, uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities, uh, is one of the largest division at the ANSA. Um, and actually within my division, even though I'm Social Sciences and Humanities, I uh, am uh, leading the program with the faculty, uh, three uh, career and technical education programs. So one is administration of justice, one is education, um, and one is paralegal. Uh, so all of those CTE programs are somewhat distributed uh, in different divisions, um, depending on, you know, the, the content and sort of the scope of the discipline that you represent within the division. Uh, but when I was in, um, in Washington, D.C., uh, working for the University of District of Columbia, I was managing with our dean there, um, almost 17 different uh, CTE programs, right? So um, from nursing all the way to hospitality, from you know, mortuary science to um, business, uh, from education 
all the way to fashion. Um, so it, it has been, um, you know, quite uh, a learning experience for me as an academic leader to really uh, dive in into the, the conversation of innovation and learning, um, even outside of my own discipline, right, as a, as a social scientist myself. So, um, so that has really been uh, sort of my journey in Perkins Five um, and CTE programs. And it has been, um, you know, quite a delight to work with faculty. Here at the ANSA, we have about, uh, in my division, we have about 150 faculty and 30 of them are full-time. Um, and part-time, uh, most of them are part-time, but they're very active. Uh, we have a large scale uh, of, uh, and range of um, different course delivery, uh, as well as, um, you know, available courses uh, every quarter. Um, so um, having moved from New York, Washington, DC, and now California, right, surrounded by all the big tech companies, how do you uh, see the difference or the common denom denominator or for the CTE programs in terms of innovation or even making it happen? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it's, I'll start with the common denominator, right? Um, my experience from New York, my experience in Washington, DC, and my experience here now uh, in California, I think the common denominator is that um, there is definitely a need um, in the workforce, right? So I think that um, the workforce data and um, whoever is uh, sort of reporting or, co or compiling those data or reporting it and, and submitting it to um, the higher institution, um, higher education institutions, um, uh, the common denominator is that every single um, uh, you know, state that I've been in, uh, in the district, um, it, it's really, really focusing on that. Like no matter where I go, I, I feel like there is a need in a certain particular workforce, right? So, and here in California, um, you know, I, I just recently learned that we have a shortage um, it for higher, um, for early um, childhood teachers, right? Um, so that's something that was quite interesting because uh, it, it was not the same um, when I was in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., when I was there, um, you know, it was more about um, the need for, um, in the next five years, the need for healthcare, um, you know, workers uh, from nursing to nursing assistant and all of that. So, um, so I, I think that um, that is somewhat, um, you know, the common denominator that every single institution that I've worked for has always been on top of their um, sort of their game in understanding like, you know, the need of the workforce. And I've been in New York, I've been in an institution um, that is um, Hispanically, uh, Hispanic serving uh, uh, sort of focus, right? Uh, most of the demographics are Latinx. Um, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., I was working for an HBCU, right, um, historically Black um, college. And here in California, uh, uh, I've, I've been, uh, you know, uh, able to work with uh, a college like the ANSA, who is, um, quite frankly, uh, catering to AAPI. So I feel like um, while my journey might be like, oh, uh, moving around, uh, it has been quite um, sort of a learning experience, I guess, uh, for me and, um, and a humbling experience to now be able to sort of work in three in different institutions that are um, minority serving, um, because I, I, I kind of get it uh, now in terms of, um, you know, uh, the similarities and, um, and of course the differences um, uh, on all the demographics. Okay, th thank you. I think that that is very refreshing. Um, and uh, with that said, uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, the other panelists all of you, uh, Maku and Charles, can you um, unmute yourself and also show your camera? Um, right, good. Uh, I think we are quite on time. <laughs> and um, I uh, want to now first, uh, very good presentation, very different ideas here about keys to the future. So uh, I want to start with asking um, and uh, just to share this notion is what is leadership, right? In education, technology, and now we can't escape from technology as, especially during the, the you know, this uh, two years, uh, the past uh, almost two years of uh, pandemic. Um, and how uh, do you uh, see um, you know, uh, leadership, right? What is leadership means to you? So uh, I can, you know, 
please feel free to just like, this is a panel discussion, right? And uh, we are using um, a technology, right? virtual meeting technology here to, to speak, uh, but uh, let's, uh, maybe I can facilitate a bit by starting with uh, uh, Maku, do you want to, um, yeah? Yeah, I think um, you can hear me now. Um, I think one of the challenges that um, anyone in this post COVID or still ongoing COVID period is, is how do we maintain this sense of inclusion as we still continue to work apart? And I, again, I always point toward um, the accessibility of the platforms and tools we use. And the tools have to be cognizant of the fact that we all have different environments and different needs that we're coming from. Um, I'm lucky because my adult children are, are grown and have moved out and I have a quiet room in my house, but I know many of our younger staff um, don't always have the luxury of quiet spaces and quiet times to, to focus and work. And um, as a leader in, in trying to um, provide a work environment that is inclusive and supports a diverse set of needs, I have to look at a lot of factors um, to make sure that everyone's voice is heard Everyone uh, has a chance to uh, um, get their ideas across and we're learning. I mean, there's a lot of things we've had to learn to do differently over the last uh, 19 months or 20 months. And so I'm still learning. I'm still uh, in a position where I get things wrong. I need to work better at how we can solve uh, communications issues and accessibility is a key part of that. Uh, Maku, uh, actually, there was a question earlier asking you also, how did uh, ETS make any new policy decisions internally as a result of the pandemic? Would you want to address that now? Mm. Well, I, th I think the main, the main point for us is that we um, focus on accessibility as, as a core part of our mission to serve all learners worldwide. That's part of our, our, our corporate mission as a, as a nonprofit education organization. And so I think it has allowed us to uh, refocus more on accessibility and try to um, uh, always improve and do better at it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so uh, let, let us ask the same question to uh, Charles, right? What, what do you think leadership is to you? And, and please feel free to all open up your mic because this is a panel discussion, yeah? No? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I, I love what Marku said about in, in inclusion and inclusiveness. I think that's, uh, that's um, something that's continuously something we have to work on. I, 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 and I think it's really important to admit that this is always a work in progress. Uh, I, I showed these examples of accessibility on our own platform and in our, in our own publications, but boy, we're a long way from perfect, <laughs> a long way. So it's always about continuing to be humble and recognizing so many um, things that still need to be fixed. Um, but I also think that, uh, you know, leadership is uh, about opening up possibility for new ways of thinking. Um, and uh, uh, for the monograph in particular, you know, we've been stuck in the same way of thinking about that book-like form for 500 years. And so, uh, you know, I think if one can create the environment for uh, scholars to be able to think in new ways about the potential for communicating their work, that is something that as leaders, we should be doing. So it's opening up those possibilities. Um I uh, want to ask a question also uh, from the uh, from the audience. Uh, how much uh, training or education do you need to give to the uh, the authors about uh, the new features that you have uh, in in their publications? Yeah, a, a, um, a, a lot. Uh, 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 this is uh, this is pretty new for them. Um, uh, uh, we have had particularly to do training around uh, visual images and the description, the alt text or the described by text. Um, and so uh, we've been doing some work around our author guidelines. There's also a, a site that we worked with the, um, uh, the, the Cress Foundation, which is an art history foundation to create called describingvisualresources.org, which is related to the excellent diagram 
site uh, run by Benetech. Um, but uh, that's been the biggest uh, hurdle to really help them to write good visual descriptions, which aren't just uh, the same as captions. You know, they are the uh, descriptions that explain how this uh, image works in the context of the argument. That's been big. And I will say also, one of the things that we've wrestled with is this is a whole new burden for authors. So we work a lot with faculty members um, at various different colleges. And this is a lot of extra work for them. Um, they are happy to embrace it. But I think we have to acknowledge that uh, you know, they're already very, very busy people. So being able to communicate why this is so important and how we can assist them is really important. Definitely. And I think that also give them an opportunity to use what um, the inherent skill set to contribute. I think that you, you demonstrated that just now, which is very good. Uh, let me turn to Alvin. Um, everybody can chime in, but uh, Alvin, let me just switch uh, the topic of uh, 2022 and beyond, you know, I, and, and I know that you already have lots of plans on that. <laughs> what is going to be your innovation strategies, you know, as we look into the future? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, there's only one thing that I, I think about, you know, moving forward in the next five years or even the next 10 years, right? Um, no matter what you do in the scope of work that you are in, um, I think that now is the time um, to be bold. Um, I think that um, my mindset is always try to be bold and try to be risky, right? Um, I, I, I think that uh, we were very much careful, um, you know, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, we've learned that a lot of the things that we did in the past is uh, pretty much status quo, right? Um, and when the pandemic happened, uh, I just wanted to add on to what Charles was saying and Marku that there's a lot of things, create, you know, creative work that has been done, um, you know, a lot of innovative work, whether it's this big or this big, right, um, that has been somewhat um, discovered um, or learned. Um, I think just moving forward, you know, there's nothing to be said, but just to be bold and, uh, and to really continue um, you know, to take this risk where, I mean, obviously you wanna manage risk and you wanna be able to have some sort of, um, you know, uh, just balance in terms of what that means for whatever company or business or um, school that you're working for. But um, being bold um, nowadays is something that uh, I, I feel that it just sets fire to not just um, with, you know, the members of any company, but also um, their customers, right? In my case, it's the students, right? Um, when we become, uh, you know, inter interested and, or uh, somewhat, uh, quote unquote, fire in, in the conversation about innovation, that um, actually, um, you know, it, it, it attracts students. And I think that um, higher education institutions has a lot to um, sort of catch up in. And I think that like, programs or initiative like Perkins Five or any other grants that must be, you know, that is being sort of provided public and private um, is giving us the challenge as stakeholders within the institutions um, to do more, right? Um, to influence more um, and to think outside the box. We are running um, a bit, uh, just a few minutes uh, more, but <clears throat> let me end by asking <clears throat> one last question and all of you can uh, open up your mind and what motivates you to share your thought leadership? You know, I'm really very honored and grateful that you are open. One of, the, uh, one of the motivation that we have doing this is to have open innovation. So I feel that you are all open innovator, right? Um, and open innovators. Uh, what motivate you to share your uh, thought leadership? And anybody wants to uh, uh, share? I start. I, I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Elton, start. Yeah. So I, I figured I'll start uh, since I, I was talking about students, right? Um, uh, students definitely keeps me grounded. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, any leader, anybody could be a leader in my mind, right? Um, but there are... Um, values and principles that each individual, all of us have that I think shines when you are leading, right? I've read a lot of different books about leadership and their thoughts and their styles and their approach. But for me, um, it always has been like, um, you know, 
if you have a mindset to be global, if you have the opportunity and the, the chance to stay relevant um, uh, and be mindful and to involve the community, um, I think that that allows you to somewhat um, first stay grounded, but also continue that learning um, as you approach a certain sort of decision-making that you will make as a leader, but that is also important Right, being global, being mindful, being relevant, and being um, part of a community also, I think, ins inspires um, uh, the people that uh, you're working with. Thank you, Alvin. Any anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that I agree with what Alvin said, and I I think the grounding is is important. Being able to listen, being able to, I think, ad adapt your mindset to those you're 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 listening and working with, and I think the other thing that that I have enjoyed about my work at ETS has been to see impact, to see the types of things that we do to improve accessibility that impact the lives of an individual learner. And so I think being able to share the impact and to empower people to say, you can have an impact through your work. And I think that's, that's uh, what keeps me going. It keeps me motivated. Thank you, Maku. <laughs> Charles. No, I, I, <laughs> <the> last I, say. <laughs> yeah, lots of always responsibility. But I, I'll say, I mean, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that excites me about sessions like this is I'm not sure I would ever have met Elvin or Maku except through this um, yes. conversation or you, Rachel. I mean, uh, and this is what I kind of love about the W3C. I mean, we tend to follow our own tracks, right? To higher education publishing. Um, uh, and uh, specialist monograph publishing. And um, I mean, honestly, Elvin, I had not been following Perkins Five at all. So I had to kind of look it up. So this <laughs> yes. kind of interchange and this opportunity to talk uh, uh, about this broader picture um, of the world of um, learners that we all share uh, a passion for. This is the wonderful thing about being able to, to be on this panel. And thank you so much uh, for making it possible, Rachel. And, and thank you, and uh, yeah, you make my you. day. And I, I want to end this session. Uh, I don't think that there's any more questions. Uh, I just take a quick uh, peep at the um, uh, audience questions. So I just want to say thank you. What an honor for me, right? I'm honored uh, to have all three of you to speak. This is the first day of the Innovation Week for Education Technology. And it's really, truly the keys to the future. Everybody is looking at that, you know, to shape our future. So thank you for leading this session together with me. And uh, thank you and have a great day. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you.